I wanted to uh, just give some stuff maybe to, uh, to Mike here. If you just want to put this in the back for me. Uh, I don't, I don't want to hand them out to you now because if I do that, you know, you won't listen to me. You'll just look at the stuff, right? So um, we do, uh, not as a church, but as an apostolic ministry, we do uh, internships for young adults. Uh, some, of, some of the folks from the congregation have done those through the years. Um, we, we like to specialize doing those in the summers, but sometimes, you know, we do them in other times too. And uh, so anyways, the information for that is on here. And I, I, I really want to leave these for the congregation because I really believe that God's going to be sending young adults here to do internships too. And so sometimes, you know, your preparation for what God's doing for you is actually participating in it and, you know, getting a picture for it and a vision for it. Uh, God has called Destiny uh, to do more than local church stuff. Amen. Well, the vision here is an apostolic center. Amen? Amen. Amen. Oh, here comes the boss. Uh, can't let that go. Well, just uh, I completely forgot. Uh, we're sending a ministry team. Uh, actually, I'm going down to Granby to minister another church on Tuesday night. But we're also sending a ministry team down to Quebec City next weekend to minister there. So if you're part of that ministry team, I think Ben and Chelsea, please stand. Uh, I'm going. I think uh, where's Mark? Where are where'd you? Mark's. Mark, yes, yeah, stand. Sorry, sorry. Direction. Stand. Uh, Marisol, I think you're able to go now. Is that, hi, there, oh, there you are, and I think Jamie and the leash are going also, okay, and, Ju oh, and Judah, yes, of course, so we're ju we just want to pray a prayer of release for the team in Quebec City, okay, uh, ministering at a, a, an English congregation in, in, the, in, the, in our provincial capital, so Father, in Jesus' name, we as a congregation just release Marisol and Mark and uh, uh, Ben and Chelsea and Judah and myself and uh, Alicia and Jamie, that God, you would anoint us and give us uh, a message and also a deposit for Evangel Church in uh, Quebec City. Lord, we bless a team that's going, traveling mercy, safety, but also a release of your power for that church and a de good deposit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, we also have on here, uh, this is a little uh, biography sheet about myself and my wife and uh, uh, the apostolic ministry that we are um, endeavoring to fulfill around the world where the Lord has sent us. Uh, interestingly, we went through some very similar transitions like what are happening here. And uh, matter of fact, six months ago, we just turned the pastoral leadership of the home congregation over to a couple that's been with us for about, I think he's been with us 17 years, and she grew up as a little girl in the church. And... Uh, so anyway, so you can know some things that we're doing. If you'd like to know more about what we're doing, that's there. This is something that I think you're going to find probably uh, published for yourselves as to how people around the world can connect with, God's, with what God's doing with you here. Because that's appropriate. There are people around the world who will have relationships with you, who will be very close ministry brothers and sisters to you as a, as a people, as a congregation, because of the calling that's on you. You're not just called to the South Shore. You're not just called to greater Montreal. You're called to the nations. And there are going to be specific places around the world where people will connect with you in very needy, affectionate, and powerful ways. So this is a brochure that we did for our ministry. Uh, and again, this stuff isn't for the purpose of recruiting as much as it's for the purpose of giving you some material to, if you look at it, it'll increase your vision. It'll, it'll help you see some things that God's doing with you that you may not see on the surface, okay? So this is how people can partner with us around, around the world. And this is a flyer here on our university. We had the opportunity to not just start a Bible school, but to uh, frame a Bible school we had into a university, a degree-granting, full-fledged university. And if you're Canadian, you can't come to this right now even if you wanted to because we don't have immigration status. So that's the thing that we're working on. So, again, this is not to recruit you to our university, but to show you some of the things that God's going to use, use you to do in this region, I believe. So this is how we've kind of framed that, okay? And, uh, and these are business cards. I'm going to keep those. 
So you just get out of here, Mike. All right. Thank you, Mike, very much. All right, uh, a big thank you to Mike, everybody. Let's just keep it happy here. And, and, and how many of us actually got the joke recently that Pastor Dave told about five minutes ago? Anybody still working on it? Sometimes you just got to put them in your pocket, and they, they laugh by themselves later, like during lunch. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I, I had some things that I was going to do today that I, that I thought uh, was going to go a different direction, but I, I really want, I want to follow up on some of the things or add to some of the things that we talked about Wednesday. Um, so if that's okay with you, uh, Pastor Apostle, Grand Poobah, uh, Papa Daddy, what are we these days? Wednesday, Wednesdays we, talk, we talked uh, uh, about primarily what is an apostle and, and their primary work. And, and I believe that as, we, as I've studied the word that I've come up with, the primary thing that apostles are concerned with is establishing the government of the kingdom. And the, the core of that is what Jesus called ecclesia. And we, we have a problem, though, that the word that the translators of the scriptures used to try to tell us what ecclesia was, is they used the word church. And, and that, is, that is from an old English, which came from a German word, kirk, which means house of the Lord. And, and that, that's left us a problem, because even today, so many people who would say, uh, where do you go to church? They're thinking of a building, the house, where they think God lives. And, of course, God doesn't live in this structure, right? He, but if we're here, he lives in us, and so he is in the structure. Then, you know, people in the world are trying to figure this out. So is he in there or not? You're like, well, he is when we are. Uh, okay. But really, we are the people of God, aren't we? And, and that's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about people, not buildings. Isn't that right? So Peter says... The Apostle Peter said it like this in one of his epistles. He says, we are like living stones being built into a spiritual house or a temple for the Lord. So, yeah, the house thing is kind of there. But that's why the word church is so confusing to people. Is, is the root meaning of the word that everybody identifies talks about a building. So it's confusing. Uh, that, that word in the Greek is the word ekklesia, and it actually means governing councils. Governing councils. In other words, governmental bodies in the earth. Um, the, the, the initial creation was when God created Adam and Eve and told them to have dominion over everything in the earth, everything that creeps on the ground, everything that flies in the heavens, so on and so forth. And the interesting thing is before God made the creation on this earth of Adam and Eve and gave them dominion, where did he cast down the devil and a third of the angels when they fell from heaven? To the earth. But the earth was formless and void. They, they were sent here for punishment. This is where they were, like uh, Great Britain used to send all their prisoners to Australia. This was like Australia for the devil. And then to make matters worse, God sent prison keepers and jailers here to make sure that the devil was under subjection, even here on this barren planet. So he created his creation, planted a garden, and created what the Bible says is that man is a lesser creation spiritually than angels. I mean, you know, angels are much more powerful than we are. They're spiritual beings. They're, they're mighty. One angel could kill us all if he had a spiritual sword and wanted to do it. I mean, we, we, we could not resist him. They're, 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 they are more powerful than we are. But God created us and put us in a garden and gave us dominion over all the earth, every, all of God's creation, and all the demonic powers that had been cast down here and imprisoned. It's kind of like uh, guys in jail being, the jail keepers being children. How insulting to the mature 
criminals in jail, that the people in charge of them are children, excuse me. I mean, it's just insulting to think about. But that is God executing his punishment and his will upon the forces that rebelled against heaven. So, of course, the devil, he gets mad about that, right? I mean, he doesn't like the situation. So, he's an angel. He's smarter than humans. He's craftier. He's trickier. And so he tricks Eve into eating the apple to disobey God, where she began to rebel against God, just like he did in heaven, knowing that God is just. God deals with all rebellion the same. It causes a separation between us and God and the loss of our authority that we once had. So, I mean, Satan, he's, he's jealous. He's bitter. He's angry. He was the worship leader of heaven. And he lost it all. And now God's replaced the, him, this lofty, beautiful, magnificent creature with instruments built into him, jewels and crowns, part of his makeup, with these two people that God made out of dirt. I mean, see, the whole thing is insulting to the fallen angels. And that's why they responded with such rage against God's creation. That's why they hate us. So Jesus came back, the Bible says, as the apostle sent from God, the apostle, apostle capital T, capital A, right? And, and, but he's also called the second Adam, isn't he? The New Testament calls Jesus the second Adam. In other words, he was going to give us another fresh start. Just like the first Adam gave us our first start and God gave him dominion, Jesus is the second Adam. The, he wiped the slate clean. He is the inaugurator of the, of the second, you know, the first, uh, uh, another clean start. And he has all the dominion, all the authority of God to rule the earth and establish the kingdom of God in the earth. So he does his thing, and the Jews are waiting for him to come because they know when the Messiah, or the Christ, which is the Greek word for Messiah, when he comes, he is going to establish the government of the kingdom. But Jesus didn't do it the way they thought, did he? They thought he was just going to blow into town on a white horse, secure the throne of David in Jerusalem, kick out Herod, and then with angel armies just completely slay and demolish the Roman armies of the world. And starting in Jerusalem, Jesus the Christ would sit on the throne, and the longer he took to do that, and the further he got from not doing that, and as from Palm Sunday, when they all welcomed him as the king, expecting him to set up his throne, a week later, he's actually being martyred or killed willingly, laying down his life by the Romans that they thought he was going to kill, they all rejected him, right? Because it didn't go the way that they thought. But what he did, he proved that he was the Christ, the Messiah, because he rose from the dead under his own power, the scripture says. Nobody has ever risen from the dead under their own power. He's the only person, the only one that's ever done that, proving that he is who he said he is. And then, when he leaves... He still doesn't establish his kingdom like we thought he was going to, but rather he had 12 of his disciples that he called apostles. The word apostles means generals. He, he set them in place as a council of 12. They're not called, you know, once he, once he designates them as the apostles, they are always called the 12. They are the council of 12 the beginning of the establishing of his government in the earth. And what did he say to them? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, and guess what? I'm giving it to you. Okay? So that is the seeds, the beginning of government. And, and they were to start in Jerusalem and begin to establish the government of God in the earth starting in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the outermost parts of the earth. And they did that. They did it wonderfully. If we read the book of Acts, which is called the Acts of the Early Ecclesia Church, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, or the Acts of the Apostles, it's called accurately all three of that, because it's really one and the same. 
It's the acts of the early church that was being established by apostles who were filled with the Holy Spirit. So who gets the credit? The, the, the government, the church? Well, sure, but who makes up the government? It's not a building. It's those apostles. It's those leaders, those ones that Jesus gave the keys to. And did they do it on their own? Of course not. They could only do it by the power of the Holy Spirit because what Jesus had commissioned them to do is impossible for anybody to do on their own. You can't do it unless you are filled with the power and the favor of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? So that's kind of what happened. And the book of Acts gives us the, the very clear picture history of how the government of God began to expand, starting in Jerusalem, into Judea, then Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. And one of the great stories we have that gives us a lot of information is the story of when Philip, who was a deacon, right? In Acts chapter 6, seven deacons were put in place to govern the congregation there in Jerusalem, to handle the disputes. To, they were looking at a major church split, weren't they? Weren't they? I mean, they were going to have a church split. The, the Greek widows are complaining against the Hebrew widows because the Hebrew widows, because they're of Jewish roots, were being favored in the distribution of food. And you've got the whole Greek aspect of the church, the Roman Greek aspect, and the uh, original Hebrew Jewish aspect of the church at war with each other. And the apostles didn't say, oh, we'll take care of this. We're the senior guys. They said, we need some other trustworthy folks we can put in charge because as important as this church split might be, we've got bigger fish to fry. We've got a kingdom to expand, not just simply a congregation to manage. So they put seven guys that were filled with the Holy Spirit, right? An original qualification for someone not who's got this lofty office, but someone who is one of the department heads, the managers, the, the, the deacons of the local congregation. These guys had to be top quality guys. Philip was one of those guys. And then when all the uproar came in, in Jerusalem, he, having also an evangelistic gifting or anointing, so he's functioning in management, but he has his own specific callings and giftings. He ends up going into Samaria, right? And we know what happens when Philip gets to Samaria. There are signs, wonders, and miracles. And these folks don't even know who the Holy Spirit is yet. But he's moving among them, doing wonderful things. It, it, is, it is so explosive, it's chaos. It's like Toronto, Brownsville. Lakeland. It's nuts. And someone, has, the guys in Jerusalem hear about that and says, it's good, it's the Holy Spirit, it's God, but this thing's out of control. It's like wildfire. We need to send some people who have the grace and the authority to set the order and cause this whole craziness, which is God, to become what it's supposed to be. It's kind of like the, the growing up of an infant in a, in a, through the toddlerhood into childhood, fast forward, fast motion. You know, if you don't step in as parental authority and set your child's life in order, they're going to have a life of chaos. But when they're little, they're ramming through the house, you know, picking their nose, dancing on the furniture, I mean, some of it, you know, depend, I suppose depending on your perspective and how <laughs> tight you are or how loose you are, I found the whole thing just hilarious. I found pretty much everything my kids did when they were little was funny. But we couldn't let them continue in their childlike craziness, right? They eventually had to have restraints, guidelines, boundaries. They're pretty soon it's just going to be chaos, you know. You, you would never be able to use your television again because they'd have pulled the knobs off and taken the television knobs and put them on the radio and the radio knobs on the stove. And, you know, you'd never be able to work anything because it would just be chaos. Cute at first, but cuteness not harnessed is just dumb, right? It's, it's, not, it's not peace. 
So, so what, the, what the church in Jerusalem did, the ecclesia in Jerusalem sent who? Peter and John to Samaria to establish the order of the kingdom. There was a kingdom explosion going on, but there was no kingdom order. A couple things to think about. Philip's already on site. Why didn't Philip do it? Because he didn't have the grace in him to do it. Grace is not God saying, ah, you're okay, no big deal. Grace, brother. That's not grace. That's mercy at best. It's ridiculous at worst. Grace is the power of God, the, 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 the favor of God. If we, could, if we could come up with a substance that we could say was liquid favor, liquid grace, like spiritual vitamin oil. And you were to drink a big gulp of it, and it turns you into somebody you weren't before, able to do things you couldn't do before. That's what grace is. Philip could not set that thing in order in Samaria, as wonderful and as good as it was, because he simply wasn't an apostle, which means he didn't have apostle grace. He didn't have that favor, that substance of calling in him. He's a good man. Matter of fact, the Bible says somewhere else that Philip had seven daughters who were prophets. Well, he had father grace, because all men, when you have kids, you have access to father grace, right? I mean, can you, can you imagine having a wife and seven daughters? And the seven daughters are prophets. Man, I'm going to pray for you, brother. <laughs> I live in a house full of women. We've got a, a number of interns. And, and rather than mixing uh, boys and girls, men and women, we just have young women. And uh, at times, I'm living in a house with seven women. And they're not all prophets. And it's already terrible, isn't it? Isn't it, Melissa? It's terrible. Uh, Melissa was with us recently. It was terrible. Uh, <laughs> Now, there's, there's times you just want to stand on the front porch and hope a man drives by. You know, you can just, testosterone, there's some. All right, thank you. Roll down your window and exhale when you drive by my house. I need that. No. So, so my point is, is, that, is that Philip, he's obviously a strong man. He's, he's, not, he's not lacking in what he's called to. But he does not have the grace to establish the order or the government in Samaria spiritually like he needed to. Being a man who could solve church problems, a man who had an evangelistic anointing, a man who raised seven daughters who were prophets. Now, this was no weakling. This was no pushover. This was a good quality man. But there are certain things that certain ministry gifts can do that the others just don't have the ability to do it. I mean, it is just amazing as I've watched this play out. You can get someone in here to pastor this church, and if they're not a pastor gift, man, they're just going to blow this thing apart. But you get someone who's got pastor grace, praise God, the thing stays together, the thing endures through the years, the thing has moments of ups and downs, but growth cycles. You get someone in here who is just a raw prophet. They're going to so offend you and not care that you left, that you're never going to, you know how it is, and, and, and you just keep chiseling away until we're like this holy remnant of three. <laughs> we, need to get the right, we need to get the right gift mixes, right? Because each one has, that's the point, each one has a different grace. Okay. So as we're talking about this this morning, you want to be thinking about what is the grace gift in you? What can you do in the kingdom? What kind of activity can you succeed at and you don't even try? You just succeed at it. Something I have found, and my wife, she chuckles about it, is when I, when I meet new people, the majority, the vast majority, there's a few who don't like me, but 99%, they just say, I kind of like that guy. And, and I, can, you know, I can be, you know, having a piece of toilet paper on the bottom of my shoe, you know, and, and I'll walk through and everyone will think it's cute. And someone else will do that and they'll go, what a slob. But for me, they just don't think that. There's a grace and a favor at work in my life that God has put there to accomplish his purposes that require people to like me and trust me on the onset. 
because I kind of go in and I mess stuff up. You know, I make things uncomfortable. You know, even like in those little video clips. I mean, the whole thing of what we're doing with this men's stuff is we are challenging men. We're poking our finger in the chest and saying, you've been living like a loser and you need to stop it. And then we smile, and they smile back. It's, it's amazing. You know, you expect someone's going to hit us one of these days. But nobody hits us, and they listen. And, and we're, we're running all over the nation, causing trouble for God. And the unsaved people are talking about it in the restaurants, and the men are saying, I want to be a part of that. And you're thinking, that's nothing but the favor of God. It's, it's nothing about me. It's just favor, a certain flavor of grace and favor that God puts on different ones. You've got a grace and a flavor on your life to do some things that nobody else can do. And so I want you to kind of think about it today as we're talking about this. What can you do that you just, you just seem to pull it off and other people just can't? That's from God. God gave you that. It, it's tied to his purpose for you in his kingdom. Amen? Primarily today. That all being said, I want to talk about this man over here. Because I, I want... <laughs> yeah, look around all you want. You can run, but you can't hide. Uh, because I want you to understand the transition of grace that's taking place in his life. Because if you can't get that, you're going to be offended, and you're going to wonder... Why, on one hand, he no longer can do or is doing what he's been doing, and if we hinder him or restrain him from moving forward, he, because he loves you, will not accomplish what he's supposed to do for God. So the bottom line here is, to you, if you let your leaders be who God has called them to be, then you can keep them. If you don't allow them to be who God is calling them to be, God will give them to someone who appreciates them and will let them. Because God's not going to allow any of us to be the restrictor valve on what he's doing in the kingdom. God will either prune us out of the equation, like cutting a limb off a tree, and we'll wonder, well, why is it suddenly that I just feel like I need to go somewhere else? Well, that's not you even wanting that. That, that's God cutting you off from where you are, sticking you onto another tree because you are blocking the sunlight from hitting this tree. You're right? So God deals with problems however he wants to deal with them. I just made up my mind I'm not going to be a problem. And, you know, we've had these conversations with our congregation because there was a season of time where, oh, man, our congregation is so patient. I mean, you, you guys remind me a lot of our congregation back home. You have been through so many circles uh, as so many dealings of activity and God and a building project and not a building project, a demolition project, a moving project, and we're going to do this. This is the vision. Well, I think now that, you know, God, uh, you know, we're like, holy mackerel, what are we, schizophrenic around here? <laughs> no, we're growing. We're growing. That's what we are. We're like a fruit tree that God planted in the front yard of a house with the intention of growing peaches. We, 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 you, get to, you get to choose the fruit this morning, Beth. Peaches. And the, the little tree, you don't just plant a seed in the yard and water it and hope a, a peach tree grows. You put it in a little container, you know, after you've soaked the seed so that the husk breaks on it, and then you put it in the dirt in a little plastic container in this thing called a greenhouse, right? And eventually it grows about this tall. And then it grows that tall, and it's got all these little shoots on the bottom, and you trim those shoots off. And it says, I thought I was supposed to grow those shoots. And you say, no, those were just practice shoots. We're cutting those off now. And the tree's going, what in the world has happened to me? Someone's cutting off my little shoots. They were such precious, pretty little shoots. As soon as they started to grow, someone shouted, hallelujah. Look, it's alive. It's growing. And then the very thing that I grew, you cut off. Excuse me. This isn't right. But that's what's good for the tree. So the tree's confused. I mean, just kind of work with me. <laughs> then eventually it gets about this big, and now it can be planted somewhere, right? It's moved out of the greenhouse into another safe place in the nursery. 
It's not put in a yard where it's going to actually produce something yet. It's put in another safe place in the business property with all the other little fruit trees. And everybody's alike. And everybody's happy. And everybody gets the equal amount of, you know, nutrition and the equal amount of pesticide. Praise the Lord. And the same amount of sunlight. And everything's fair. And then God says, well, you know, as you're growing, this tree's really growing fast. We're going to give it a little more nutrition because, boy, that's a hungry, hearty tree. And all the other trees are going, that's not fair. <laughs> I ever said that's not fair? But God works at us all at our own pace, doesn't he? Some of us just grow faster, and some of us are always whining and complaining and offended. <laughs> kind of like the two swings of the pendulum. But we want to be somewhere in the middle there, don't we? where we're growing in God, but we're not always offended, wishing it were fair. And that's where we need, you know, we probably grew up in a home without a father, if we think that things are supposed to be fair, because one of the things that fathers say more than anything else is, get a life, get over it, life's not fair. <laughs> so we, we learn that life is not fair. But eventually that tree gets planted in a yard. Well, it's already moved three times. From a little bowl where the seed was breaking open to a little dish, to a little ball of burlap fabric, right? And then you get plunked into a lawn. And not only do you get planted into another new place, then someone's going to put ropes on you. Wait a minute, I thought we were free around here. I don't want no ropes on me. I want to be free to grow however I feel like growing. <laughs> And the gardener says, well, you are free. This is a free property. This is a free house. This is a free family. But, man, you're growing all crazy, silly. That's like Samaria right there, right? And they sent down the apostles to put some ropes on this thing to say, this is going to blow itself out like, a, like an oil well fire if we don't put some ropes on it, some guidelines, some order, some government. And now we feel like, man, everybody's telling me what to do. It's like getting a job. You know, when you're a teenager, oh, I can't believe it, my boss actually wants me to work. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't just give you money for showing up. And then, and then I remember I, I, I was in restaurant management. I, I managed a Mexican restaurant, and I managed with uh, Pizza Hut restaurants for a number of years. And I hired a lot of high school kids, you know, 17, 18 years old. And some of these guys, you know, they needed a job. And the only reason they had the job is so they could make a little money on the weekend to take their girlfriend out. You know, sort of like the athletes, you know. <laughs> you know, and you'd say, they say, I'm here. I said, well, did you punch in? Oh, I forgot. They go and they punch in. And then they stand there and they look at you. What do you want me to do? I said, well, we're going to have you, you know, making pizzas today. Oh, good, because I hate doing dishes. I'm like, I don't care if you hate doing dishes. You're just lucky I needed pizzas made or you'd be washing dishes. I need you to do what I need you to do. Uh, whoa, okay. You know, so they'd make some pizzas and it'd be slow. I said, well, now we're going to have to, you know, we need to get those dishes washed. Oh. Hey, does it matter that he hates doing dishes? No, he's going to do the dishes if he's going to work for me because that's what we need done, right? Now we're going to, you know, we need to sweep up the floors, you know, keep all the cheese and the vegetables off the floors. Oh, I hate sweeping. I'm thinking, well, is there anything you like to do other than make pizzas? Not really. You know, at the end of the night, you've got to clean the bathrooms, right? And they'd say, I thought I was a cook. Well, if you're the closing cook, everybody cleans the bathrooms if you're the closing, what the closing cook does. Can I close and not do all this work? I'm thinking, you know, no, exactly, you can't. It's, this is how it works. But eventually we grow up, and we're management material, and we're eager. We say, hey, can I learn how to do the books? Because I think that would make me a more valuable person to the company. Maybe I'd get a raise if I could do some other things I don't know how to do right now. That's what God's doing with us. As we're growing in the kingdom, he's teaching us new, new abilities, new skills. But it's not our human fleshly nature to want any of that. We just want life comfortable, don't we? I mean, for the most part, doggone it, we're Canadians. 
No, we're not, are we? You're Canadians. I'm from the U.S., but we're the same way. In North America, we want our comforts. We want it our way. We really believe McDonald's. Have it your way, you know, fast, quick. You don't want pickles? Just let me know. But the problem is we're part of the kingdom. And God says, you don't want pickles? Sorry, it's got pickles. Start liking pickles. <laughs> it's kind of like growing up in a house. I, I go to some people's homes, and the mother, she's, she's crazy. And she says to Billy, what do you want for lunch? I want grilled cheese. And she goes to Susie, what do you want? I want peanut butter. And mom goes, oh, praise the Lord, an easy one. And then, and then she goes to the next kid, what do you want? Chicken nuggets. You know, and I'm thinking, this mother is insane. She's going to make three lunches for three different kids? You're kidding me. But what we learned growing up, isn't it, is whatever mom cooks, that's what you eat. And that's supposed to get us ready. That's supposed to get us ready to know God. Because God doesn't show up and say, what would you like to do with your life? What, what would you like to do today? God's not doing that with anyone in the ministry. He's not doing it with anybody in this room. He's saying, I created you for a purpose. And your job is to grow and change and to learn, be stretched, be planted, be transplanted. We have people that come to Maine that God sends to us. And as soon as they get there and they experience the winter, <laughs> they, 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 they spend all winter saying, I just hate the cold. And I'm thinking, what a stupid thing to say. Don't you think it'd be a little smarter if you set yourself in agreement with God and saying, I am learning to love the winter. I mean, wouldn't the whole thing be a lot easier, right? It'd be a lot easier. R right? <laughs> this is a, yeah, yeah. Until you retire. And then you spend half your money living in Florida for half the year, and the other half of your money living here. Yeah, because you never got ha yeah, because you never got happy. Get happy, Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's like that with our callings. It's like that with our giftings. It's like that being in the congregations where God has called us. The Bible says God takes the lonely, he puts them in families. God has put us together here at Destiny Church, the fellowship part of this Destiny Greater Apostolic Ministry, as a spiritual family. We build relationships. We grow where we're planted. We, we learn to be joyful and happy. We, the Bible calls it content. There is great authority and blessing in being content with where we are, what's happening around us. I remember when I was in management, there was a time where they, where they downsized. And I was, I was the second level manager. I was, interestingly, just so you kind of know the, the feelings I would have felt, I was the highest paid um, uh, second tier manager in the nation for both Pizza Hut and Chi Chi's Mexican restaurants, which was the Mexican restaurant. And, and then they did downsizing. And they said, well, if you want to keep your job, not only are you going to have to be the senior associate uh, manager for the restaurant, you are going to have to take the responsibility of training all the general managers before we put them in the other restaurants. And I'm thinking, well, am I not next in line? <laughs> and it was like, maybe, maybe not. But whether you think you are or not, you're going to be training all the other general managers who are going to get their own stores. If you want to keep, if you want to keep a job. You know, I mean, so I, had, I had to be flexible. And man, that was a real shot to my pride, my ego. Uh, could have been a shot to my pocketbook. I'm doing another third more work. You know, some of us have, you know, in this economy that we're in right now, some of us have, have been like that. You're working at a bank, you used to be a teller, but now not only are you a teller now, they've added all these other responsibilities to the teller department because they had to get rid of some of those employees because they couldn't meet their budgets and, you know, we just got to decide whether or not we're going to be content with the stuff that life throws at us. 
because that's part of God shaping us and making us. Now, on our jobs, because money's involved, we usually suck it up and say, okay, I'll take it. At least I'm bringing home a paycheck. But when God pulls that stuff on us in church, excuse me, I got to take this. This is where I go to get, not to give. And I'm not really committed to these people. We're just all a bunch of cows lined up at the feeding trough because the food's there the way we like it every day. I just go along for the ride, and because I've been doing that for four or five years, everyone thinks I'm really committed to this household, when actually I'm not. I show up because the food's good. Yeah, I like the food. I mean, Pastor Dave's one of the best teachers I've ever known. Uh, the worship around here is fantastic. It's excellent. You got two or three, four, I don't know how many groups you have that are kind of amorphous worship teams that can kind of throw themselves together during the week and just land a smack dab in the presence of God on a regular basis. You can't find that hardly anywhere. So I'm going to that destiny place because, man, that's a place where I'm inspired. I feel God. I get fed. I, 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 I. And, uh, <laughs> amen's not an I word. <laughs> and then God says, well, I'm going to change a little bit of that now. I'm going to do something different with this guy over here with the silver hair. And, and we're thinking, well, wait a minute. What does that mean about me, me, me? <laughs> At least you I know that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> and the bad part is, mine's going gray. And I, by the time it's all gray, I won't have any. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Although I know people in Argentina who can give me hair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, I feel better. But I'm content. But it's not fair. No. <laughs> Life's not fair. Thank you. A fatherly voice, Pastor Debbie. <laughs> oh, is that you? A fatherly voice from a woman. Well, I guess that works. Yeah. It's not fair. <laughs> I get whatever hair I get. <laughs> Suck it up, John. <laughs> Moving on. Just going to feel like we have to say la right there. Just think about it. All right. So here God's, God's doing all this shifting, all this changing. Uh, what does this mean about the vision? Well, what do we care about the vision? We're in it for ourselves anyways. That's just a smoke screen. We just... God's working on a vision. God's doing something in the earth. God's doing something on the South Shore that's going to affect greater Montreal. That's going to affect Quebec. That's going to affect this region. One of the things we began to do in Maine is we began to catalog the prophetic words that God had been speaking into our region called Maine. And we realized when God spoke to us, he identified us as one of three ways. He would speak to us prophetically as Maine, there were times he would speak to us as part of New England, because that's the region of the United States we're in. But just as many, equally number amount of times, God would speak to us as part of the Northeast, Quebec, the Maritimes, and New England. The kind of like the Acadian region. And, and we began to understand that the plan of God is bigger than what we see. We just get little glimpses and pieces of you know what Paul said. We look into a glass darkly. You know, it's kind of like looking through one of those shower doors where it's got that glass that's all wavy. It's translucent. And you look and you think, it uh, looks like somebody's in there. Right? <laughs> we don't want to go any further with that, do we? Yeah. It's kind of like that for us in the kingdom. <laughs> In kind of a different way. It's the same, but very different. <laughs> where, where we sometimes look at something so frequently, and then we think we have a clear vision of it, when really all we've been doing is looking through the same wavy glass a lot. And we really don't know what is on the other side and what it really looks like. Until God pulls that door open, and we find out, it's a giraffe in the shower. <laughs> You know, I knew someone, something, something was going on, you know, and 
what's, what's going on is not what was going on. It's not taking a shower. It's, you know, it's just there. Um, I got a whole bunch of stories that just came to mind, and I'm not going to tell you any of them. <laughs> They're just complete distraction, but my mind is racing off into humorous rabbit trails right now. Okay. So what's God doing with him? God is transitioning him from a, a grace that has been primarily pastor-teacher into a grace that is primarily apostle teacher. And that changes everything, but then again, should really change relatively nothing. It, do, it doesn't matter if I'm the fruit tree planted in the yard, staked down and content with what kind of flowers God plants in the flower garden around me. It doesn't change anything for me. I'm a fruit tree. I'm in place. I'm staked down. If God wants to plant some daisies next to me one year, or some, that's the only flower I know, tulips the next year, or maybe some, thanks for all the help. Yeah. I was hoping to hear someone say chrysanthemums, just to prove I can say it and not be tongue-tied. It, it, it just doesn't matter to me. My role here as part of the apostolic council of this, of this ministry does not change. I'm for you. I'm not against you. I'm available. I'm in love with you. I'm connected with you. What God does to the individuals, as far as what he's called me to, I'm going to be faithful to my charge. I'm going to grow where I'm planted. I'm going to let God put whatever ropes on me he wants to put on me. I'm happy when God is doing stuff in all of our lives. Will it affect me differently? Will my relationship with David change? Yeah, absolutely. Of course it will. But I still have my relationship with David. I still know where we stand. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I wanted to give you ten things today. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck to me. Ten things that are common confusions about apostles. Because he is, he is pressing more deeply into an apostolic call in his life. And you need to understand uh, that that's what that is that's going on. And then not have a wrong understanding of apostolic ministry. Where the devil gets you want to be one of the critical complainer troublemakers. Because... In every house, well, not every house, every large house, the scripture says, there are honorable vessels and there are dishonorable vessels. And so what I'm hoping to encourage you at this morning is that you would make up your mind today that you are in this large house, that means, you know, in the household of the Lord, this, this larger extended family, we call it a church, spiritual family, that you are not going to be a vessel of dishonor. But because you get some things that maybe you didn't get before, that you're going to be a vessel of honor. That you will be, in other words, if you're a vessel of dishonor, you maybe use it every once in a while, but you're like wood, clay, you know. Then there are also, the scripture says, vessels of gold and silver, you know, Ming Dynasty China pottery. Ooh, that could be you. It really, it could be. Why not? Why not you? Why settle for being a wood or a clay pot when the potential that resides on the inside of us is for us to be a vessel of honor? Gold, silver, delicate china. Why not? What, what is the difference between me being usable and unusable? Whether or not I choose to be a vessel of honor or dishonor. Is it really that simple? Yeah, it's just, it's, it's just that simple. And that's why the Bible says contentedness is a means of great gain. I step into my destiny. I mean, here, here, the name of this whole thing is called destiny. How can we forget that we have one? You know, we don't, you know, maybe, maybe that's the problem. In our minds now, we go to destiny rather than we have one. Uh, maybe, maybe we need to teach on that, but we're not going to today. So ten things... 
10 things that are common confusions about apostles. Number one, there's always someone sitting in the room that says, well, weren't there only 12 apostles? And when the last one died, don't, didn't we have no more apostles? And that's not true. The Bible actually lists by name 23 or 25, depending on how you count them. Um, Timothy was an apostle. Silvanus was an apostle. Uh, Paul and Barnabas, were they apostles? Yeah, they weren't the, the, the first 12. Didn't they, uh, didn't they, as governing officials, that's what apostle means, they're the leaders of government, when Judas uh, took his life and was no longer one of the 12, they went to the scripture and the scripture says, let his office another man take. So they put forward two of the best guys and they chose one of them and he took the place of, of Judas, who, who hanged himself. And that guy's name was Matthias. Uh, was he not an apostle? Some people say, well, Jesus, Jesus left the other 11 in charge. He says, I give you the keys. I give you all authority. And we're missing a guy. And God didn't say, oh, yeah, I forgot. I'll, I'll take care of that one more thing. God says, I left you in charge. Take care of this stuff. And they did. And he became an apostle. So the apostles weren't just these 12 that were chosen by Jesus and then there could be no more because Jesus wasn't here. That Jesus extended his authority to those 11. They filled the holes. They filled the gap. They lay hands on others. They, they developed apostolic companies. And the Bible names 23 apostles. So, no, uh, there weren't just 12. There were many more. Number two, People say the Bible has been written, so we don't need apostles anymore. You know, I figure we might as well just, you know, we might as well deal with this, cut the head off this whole thing. I don't know if I believe in apostles right up front, because that is such a major component of this ministry. For years, I, I didn't like dealing with stuff forcefully and up front until people who had been with us three, four, five years would suddenly say, I don't know. I think we're going to go down the road. We never really did believe in women in ministry. And I'm thinking, my God, half our leadership is women. And for four or five years, you've been sitting around here, getting along, taking everything we're feeding you, growing, talking like you're part of the team, and the whole time you've been harboring this judgment against women? So then I began to say, we're going to have to tackle this right up front. So we tackle that now in our welcome to the church classes. <laughs> These are all the reasons you probably don't want to be a part of this church. <laughs> we have women in leadership. Got a problem with that? And we, you know, <laughs> I got a problem with that. Okay. We're going to make a note of that. Now, would you like to know what the scripture teaches? Not really. I just don't think women can be in leadership. Brother, let me give you the names of about seven churches that would really fit you a whole lot better. Rather than wasting your time for three years and then later telling me, or more important to me, wasting my time for three years and pretending you're not, let's just be straightforward. In this church, apostles is part of our doctrine. We believe the New Testament, for goodness sake. We believe that the Word of God is eternal and God doesn't change little parts of it because someone has some dispensational theology that says, well, I don't know if it fits my dispensational theology. Fooey on your dispensational theology. The Word of God says of itself, it'll never pass away, and God's never taken it back. So if it's God's will a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, it's his same will today. He didn't write another Bible. That's just all there is to it. And... Uh, there are people who just don't believe that. They don't want to believe that. So we just help them get connected where they want to be with other folks who are deluded. No. Okay. Number three. I mean, somewhere you, somewhere you just got to settle it inside yourself. If people don't want to believe what I believe, that's okay. But this is what I believe. This is what we believe. This is what we hold in common. Amen? Okay, number three that they must physically see Jesus, an apostle. So that's usually spoken three years from now by someone who has tolerated the apostolic talk 
and then three years from now says to someone, I'm just not convinced he's an apostle because, you know, I don't think he ever saw Jesus. Well, nowhere in the Bible is that given as a criterion for being an apostle. First off, it's, it's, it's never there. It's never given as a sign or a mark of an apostle. The one place that does appear is where the apostle Paul is having a little bit of a contest of, how, how many of you know these, these 12, even at the Last Supper? They're still arguing about who's greatest. Who among us is the super apostle? Who's called and going to have a seat next to Jesus in the heavenly kingdom closer than the others? I mean, this was going on at the, the day that Jesus is preparing them for him to be crucified. Every, every, every time there was a little, you know, break in the action, these guys are wrangling about who's going to be first, who's going to be second, who's going to be third. And Paul is addressing that kind of, well, we're 100% Jews. We are the original leaven plus one. And, and Paul's saying, hey, look, you recognize I'm called as an apostle. Why do you want to rank us? This is a super apostle. This is, this is a mediocre apostle. Paul says, and so I, I, I came before those who consider themselves pillars, those who are the eminent apostles, and says, I'm no less an apostle than you. You want to lay this Jewish thing on me? You want to lay this Jesus appointed me stuff on me? And in his case, he was able to say, well, you know what? Jesus showed up and spoke to me personally. I did see Jesus. So you can't even say you got that one on me. The issue was not he was proving his apostleship because he saw Jesus. He was saying, you can't put me down and consider me a second-class apostle because there's no difference at all between us, okay? But that is never in the Scripture given as a qualification for apostles. It's a confusion. Number four, apostle is not a ministry position. It's not something you can say, geez, I'd just love to be an apostle. I'm going to work real hard and become an apostle. It's a calling. It's something that God has created you for. And then in the right time, he gives that spiritual goo, you know, we call grace, that substance. You know, people will say sometimes, during that service, I just felt like liquid love. That's what I'm talking about. Grace is a, is, is a, sub, a spiritual substance like that, isn't it? It's, it's, it's like feeling... It's like being filled up with this, this well, li liquid vitamins. It's vitamin oil. It's, it's something that God gives, and you can't manufacture. It's not like, boy, wouldn't I like to be apostle? Then people would respect me. Uh, you know, no, it doesn't work like that. Uh, matter of fact, you find out when you begin to pursue the apostolic ministry that you're called to, there's more people that don't respect you than people that respect you. It's, 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 not, it's not an all-win situation. It's a, it's a big lose situation at times. Number five, the apostles are not on the top of the pile. They're actually on the bottom of the pile, holding the pile up. So the confusion is thinking that apostles are, you know, like you've ascended to this place of prominence or greatness. And, you know, on one hand, we, we honor and respect the office of apostle, but as God is transitioning Pastor Dave into this where he will be recognized as Apostle David, he's not promoting him. He's not putting him on the top of the pile. I mean, top of the pile doesn't work anyways. He's, he's already, if you're thinking like top of the pile kind of thinking, isn't he already on the top of the pile? I mean, he's already the senior minister, you know. What does Apostle do for him? It, it doesn't do for anything for him in the region. It's not like as soon as someone says, we recognize him as an apostle and lay hands on him and release him into the fullness of it, which is coming shortly, probably in the springtime, that, that everyone all around greater Montreal is going to say, oh, that's wonderful. I mean, what that evokes in most religious-minded people is competition, right? 
So here, on the top of the pile, he's actually relatively at peace with his peers. But what his peers, who are still his peers, will be thinking of him in the ministry occupation, Lord only knows what they're going to think, because flesh is quirky. Flesh becomes jealous. Flesh is competitive, isn't it? And so we need to know where that stands so we don't get caught up in that. So number five, apostles are not the top of the pile. Rather, they're under the pile, supporting the pile. Number six, they're not network leaders or megachurch pastors. Big is not the word that describes apostles. Big does not describe apostles. Joel Osteen, he's got one of the largest churches in the United States. He ain't apostle. He... He, he couldn't fulfill an apostolic call in his life if he had to. He doesn't have apostolic grace. Is he a successful pastor? Yeah, if you measure it in nickels and noses, yeah, he's pretty successful. He's got a big congregation, but big does not mean apostle. Number seven, they're not a missionary or a church planter. Some people go, oh, wait a minute. Uh, missionaries... Missionaries can be evangelists who are working overseas, pastors, teachers, prophets. Just because you're a missionary doesn't mean you're an apostle. Many apostles do, you know, I'm going to Belize. Some people say, well, that's mission work. Okay, in my case, I'm an apostle who's doing some missionary work. But not everyone who does missionary work are apostles, are they? There are some really good pastors who are laying down their life for people in other nations who are wonderful missionaries, and they are not apostles and they're doing exactly what God's called them to do. Church planters. Church meaning congregation. Just because I start a bunch of congregations doesn't mean that I'm an apostle. I could be a pastor who does that. I could be an evangelist who does that. Okay? The apostolic call is the establishing of kingdom government. Who planted, who started that whole church thing in Samaria? Philip did. Who brought it into order and brought government to it? The apostles did. So it's a pretty good argument who planted it. But it's obvious who established it. Apostles established government. Everybody with me so far? We're wrapping up quickly. I know we're getting late. Number eight, they have a different grace than prophets. Apostles need to be able to teach they also have a lot of revelation, like prophets. Prophets usually need to be able to teach, and they have a lot of revelation, right? But prophets, they are the ones who, who declare the possibilities. They paint the picture with broad brush strokes, and then they fine-tune the picture with smaller brush strokes. Prophets are the one who release the initial vision until the apostles show up on the construction site with a blueprint, drive the stakes into the ground, and bring in the excavators and start building. So there's two different things. We've got the ones who communicate the dream and the heart of God, and the others who actually are charged with the anointing and responsibility to build what God is dreaming. Make sense? All right, we're going to be okay. They're, they're excited about getting in here with mom and dad. Number nine, an apostle in town is not the leader of the local pastor's association. He's not the leader of the clergy. Again, he's governmental. He's setting order. He's a kingdom guy. He's not necessarily a clergy guy. Now, some towns... If they have a clergy association and someone happens to be an apostle, sure, he could serve as the president. There, there's no prohibition against that. But some places of the world, whoever is the lead clergyman in town, even though he has no apostolic gifting, no prophetic gifting, and he's an evangelist, but he's the senior guy, they'll call him the apostle because to them, apostle means senior clergy. And that is not a Bible definition of apostle. Okay? So they call them what they want. It's no skin off my nose. But that's not, that's a, that's a fusion. That's not an accurate picture of an apostle. So Pastor David, when he's fully released into apostolic ministry in his transition, he doesn't have to be the leader of the local clergy. It's not like part of his job description. 
If they all say, hey, we'd love for you to be our leader, you can take the job if you want it. There's no prohibition against it, but there's no mandate from God that says, you've got to be able to work with all the clergy in town. When Paul blew into town, all the clergy wanted to kill him. I just hope that's not your case, actually. And number 10, the apostle is not focused on the same issues as the other fivefold ministries. Pastors and evangelists, they are focused on conversions, baptisms. Pastors, they are counselors, extraordinary counselors. Apostles usually would rather kill someone than counsel them. Well, here you've got this guy who has really got apostolic seeds in his life, who has learned to become a skillful counselor. But I can tell you right now, it's probably never been your strong point, has it? It's always been teaching and studying and strategizing and envisioning. And so he's in a transition of having filled a, a, a pastoral role where God gave him the pastoral grace to fill that and, and to succeed at it. I mean, look at us. Here we are. We've been partakers of that grace. It's impacted us. We've been brought into this family called destiny. That's, that's a testimony to the grace of God, not who he is. And as God transitions that grace... God's not going to leave us out in the cold. He's just going to do some different things with him. And because he's apostolic, there will be strategies to make sure that we're ministered to, counseled, encouraged, evangelism continues. But the grace on his life is shifting. He's not going to be able to continue to be concerned with the evangelistic efforts of the youth night. He's not going to be able to be concerned about Who's got the counseling and who's got these problems and who's that? This is now where a time where as we've been maturing together, the body is building itself up in love. Other leaders are being recognized among us. And some of that took place, what, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Key, key, key. Congratulations to those who are recognized. Um, you are key parts of the puzzle. And a lot of the things that these other leaders are going to do are things that he's got to continue to let more fully go of. Well, what does that mean about me? Is he still going to be like this man I admire? Is he still going to be here? Are we still going to be able to experience Dave Hibbert, this man that for many of us is the reason we're here because we love Pastor Dave? Yeah, he's still going to be Papa here in this house. He's, he's not going away, but his job description in God is continuing to change. Does that make sense? So on one hand, we want to be at peace with that. On the other hand, when we feel the little tensions because the ropes on us as a little tree are getting pulled, that we don't get freaked out and think something bad is happening. It's not. The transition for him is a transition for all of us too. The end of it is going to be wonderful. God is wanting to take us from glory to glory. Let's let God do in each of us as individuals and even as leaders what he wants to do. Does that help? Does that make sense? So as you locate, if you took some notes, if you, as you look at those 10 things, uh, think about those. Study them. I didn't give you a ton of scripture. I've, I've laced this whole thing with scripture all through. Uh, those of you who know the scripture recognize that. Um, but these 10 points, you could take that home. You could study that and say, man, this is really interesting. What do I expect of him as this changes? I don't want to be stuck in a religious mindset expecting some false tradi traditional nonsense from him as he transitions. I want my expectations to match what God says my expectations should be. I don't want to hold him to something that's some religious nonsense or Christian folklore or dispensational, you know, delusion. But I do expect him to fulfill the call of God in his life. Pastor Dave, we expect you to fulfill the call of God in your life. We expect it of you. Now, now, now can, can you say that and actually set your heart in agreement with that? Does that, does that doesn't sound bossy, does it? I mean, as a, as a son in, growing up in my dad's house, I expected my dad to be a godly man. That was a valid expectation. I expected my dad to work hard, to provide for our family, to love my mom. That was a valid expectation. I should never have an apology for saying something like that. 
I'm not coming up over my leaders, being able to clearly define what I expect from them. But I can tell you this. We expect each other to fulfill the call of God in our life. If we do not fulfill that, we are, of all men, sadly, we should be disgraced and ashamed. We must fulfill the call of God in our lives. So let's close this morning. Let's all stand. And just as a, a declaration together, if it's in your heart to do so, let's just, uh, let's just look at Pastor Emerging Apostle Dave. And just from your heart, from your heart, just look at him. Make eye contact with him. I mean, he can't make eye contact with one of us. But as he just looks through, yeah. Make eye contact with him. No, no matter where you are, whether you're young in the Lord or mature in the Lord, you've been here forever or you're new, if you can look someone in the eye and say, you know, if there's one thing I expect, I expect you to fulfill the call of God in your life. If you can say it with a clear heart, with conviction in your heart, that's, that's faith. That's the power of agreement. That is important to us as leaders. So right now, let's just do that. Just, you know, wherever you are, just look at them. Talk about being on the spot. Uh, just look at him. Look, look at his eyes. Don't say, well, I expect you to fulfill the call. I mean, you know, it's like, like what I just did. Pastor Dave, I expect you to fulfill the call of God in your life. Just go ahead and say that if you're in agreement with that. Let's say it again. You felt that, didn't you? It, it is important. Say it one more time as he just kind of looks through. Just as he looks through, just say it. But no pressure. No. no. no, 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 no. <laughs> thank you, John. Thanks for the warning. <laughs> Father, we just thank you for John's word today. We bless him. We bless him. We bless his uh, trip home. And we bless him for having the courage and the, uh, the grace to be on our apostolic council. Lord, we bless him and Linda today and uh, Strong Ministries and all the ministries that are flowing out of that. Lord, let your blessing and your grace increase on, on him and Linda. We bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, can I get a dose of that?